made the, you made the team. Good evening, and welcome to the August meeting of the Granville Exempted uh, Board of Education. Would you please join us? Rise and join us. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First, we'd like to recognize the GHS Varsity Baseball team for winning the division district title this year. Um, with a record of 19 and 8, Granville beat Bishop Watterson 7-4 in a thrilling comeback victory, and then lost to CJ, which is who went on to become the eventual state champions 3-1 at regionals. Uh, we've invited the senior boys, but you know what you do when you have senior boys. They're not here, but their coach is here. And, um, uh, coach Adam Bennett, in his first year, uh, congratulations. And please, if you could pass these on to the boys, we'd certainly appreciate it. But great job this year. And uh, I think the team did very well. It was the game against CJ, I was there. And it, if we would have gotten out of the first inning, the rest of the game was, I mean, Curtis really through well after that first inning, so it was a good game to watch. So congratulations. Thank you. And this is the, and then we'll take a brief picture. Okay, thanks. All right. Thank you, appreciate it. And now I'd like to invite Kinmore Smith, uh, the Central Regional Manager of the Ohio School Boards Association, to come forward and recognize our board members for their years of service to the district. I also have another award for you. I have that overall A award for you. Oh, so. no, I didn't realize that. Yeah. So greetings from the Ohio School Board Association, and thank you, Jeff and board members, for allowing me to participate in your meeting this afternoon. It is a pleasure to be with you. The central region of the Ohio School Board Association, or the Ohio School Board Association, is divided into five regions, and the central region um, is uh, serves 14 counties and 103 public school districts. And I have left some packets on your table, and at this time, the region's actively promoting Kids Pack. It's our political action committee for public education. I don't need to explain why that's important. The Student Achievement Fair, uh, I, we are still taking some entries for that. Granville has participated in that, and we appreciate that. And the Student Achievement Workshops. Our region also, for the people in the audience who are not familiar with us, we also conduct a fall and a spring conference, and we recognize the achievements of school districts, board members, teachers, community members, and district employees, and we support success through a system of committees. But tonight I'm here to recognize the accomplishments of the Granville Exempted Village Schools and to present to Board of Education members Janice and Kornman their Milestone Service Awards. First, I'll start with the recognition of the OLA Award. While you uh, received this, you earned this about a year ago, um, we are going to present this to you tonight. The overall A Award is presented by the State Board of Education and recognizes schools that earn an overall A on their report card. There were only 28 districts in the state who earned the overall grade of A in 2017-2018, and Granville was one of three in the central region. So I have that plaque for you if somebody would like to. Amy, you're close. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you are it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next, we recognize the service of, and we present to Granville Exempted Village board members Russell Janice and Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Kornman, 
their 10-year milestone service awards. Russell and Jennifer, we thank you for your commitment, your dedication to your community, to the families, and um, to the uh, students in Granville. And uh, I'd like to read your certificates and have the two of you come forward, please. Yeah, that now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Good one. All right. I'll start with Russell's. I'm going to read each of your certificates. It's a Distinguished Board Member Certificate. The Ohio School Boards Association recognizes Russell Janice as a 10-year veteran board member and for continued dedication and commitment to public education as a school board member. Signed by Richard Lewis, our Chief Executive Officer, and by, that's John W. Haukius, the Ohio School <laughs> Board Association President. Congratulations. <laughs> Distinguished Board of Education for the Ohio School Boards Association recognizes Dr. Jennifer Kornman as a 10-year veteran board member and for continued dedication and commitment to public education as a school board member. Signed by Richard Lewis and John W. Hopkins. Congratulations. <laughs> also thank all of you and our talented administration and treasurers, other administrators in the community, but we thank you all for working together. It's because of efforts such as yours that we enjoy strong public schools in Ohio, so thank you all very much. We thank you for And Mark, who is also with OSBA, was supposed to be here and do a little member engagement, but he had to cancel this morning, so that frees up um, our agenda slightly okay. from a staff member report. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Are those people a bit like Yes, <laughs> yes. If you would like to leave at this time, uh, we will not look down at you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, takes us to Brittany and the financial report. You have uh, July's monthly financial report in front of you. Um, starting on page two is our general fund historical summary. So this is the high level showing where we landed at the end of July of the current fiscal year compared to the last three fiscal years in July. Um, so overall, our revenue is up almost 23% over the last three years, um, and expenditures are right in line after accounting for the reductions we made last year. Um, so those two combinations um, have added about $4.4 million for to our ending cash balance for the month. Flipping over to page three, this is the revenue detail, so I have the month of July compared to the forecasted amount for the year. And then I included a percentage of the total forecast. So our revenue doesn't come in exactly <coughs> in a constant even rate across um, the whole fiscal year. So we expect to see some variance in that percentage column. On the property tax, um, it's primarily due to timing, how that comes in when the county auditor receives those tax payments and then when they pass that along to us. Um, we are, they are still anticipating that we'll receive our tax settlement by the end of August. So we should have um, actual figures for the first half settlement um, next month. The next item to know, of course, is the income tax payment that we received um, at the end of the month. This came in higher than expected, almost $175,000 more than what we had originally forecasted. So we will uh, monitor that throughout the year and adjust the forecast um, coming up in the fall. And flipping over to page four for the expenditure detail. Unlike the revenues, we would anticipate um, a fairly even percentage on the expenditure side. So with uh, ending the month of July, that's 112 out of our fiscal year, which is about 8%. So um, that's kind of where uh, we would expect to see on each of the individual line items. So as you can see, salaries and benefits are falling right in there. 
um, around 8%. Purchase service is slightly higher at 10% of the total forecasted amount, and that's primarily due to our um, liability insurance payment that we make every year in July, so that kind of skews um, July, but as the year uh, goes on, that should level out. And then the last item to note under the other objects, $25,000, that was for um, the collection fees for the income tax payment. So that's the cut that the state takes to collect our money for us. Yeah. <laughs> um, turning over to page five is just a graphical res representation of the summary level revenue and expenditure data. So the orange bar represents the revenue, which is showing that general increase over the last three years, um, whereas the blue bar for expenditures is um, remaining relatively flat over the historical Page six is a snapshot of our capital budget to actual. This is not as of July 31st. Um, I included anything that we had paid or encumbered um, up through last week just so that it was more timely given all of the summer projects that you'll hear about in the next staff report. Um, so what I did here was take our original budget that we set um, for the capital funds, which are, there's actually three different um, funds that combine to make our overall capital budget. So all three of those combined um, comes out to be about $2 million for our total budget. Um, then in the second column, B, there's hundred about $160,000 of carryover from the prior year. So those are projects or purchases that um, were made before June 30th and then have paid out or we expect to pay out here in the next month or so. So those two columns, A and B combined, gives our total budget for the year in column C. And in column D are actual expenditures. So those are either the items from prior year that have paid out in July or the first um, week of August, as well as any projects that finished up early um, on in the summer and have already invoiced and paid out. Then column E is uh, the outstanding encumbrances. So that's gonna be anything that um, is either work still in progress or has just finished up and we just haven't received the invoice and processed payment yet. Um, so then the final column F is the remaining balance. So it takes our total budget, subtracts out the actual expenditures that have paid out, and then subtracts out those encumbrances that we're expecting to pay out um, to leave a total remaining balance of about $1.1 million. Um, a word of caution, because that seems like, oh, we've only spent, or we've spent half of our budget and we're, you know, a month through the year. But this is, a lot of this is projects that are done over the summer. So it makes sense that we would be um, kind of at this point. Um, and the other items to know, we have on here the about $200,000 for the track and uh, 150 for the bleachers. And those are gonna roll over into the project fund to go towards um, our portion of the athletic project. So keep that in mind as well with that. Any questions about the capital budget? I know this is new to the financial report and kind of a different format than what we've seen in the past. So on the outstanding um, capital budget for remaining balance, that's projected cost for all of the projects that we have contracts or agreements for. Correct. Presumably there's some in that budget that's for contingency, so it's possible that we don't utilize all that if we say we contingency. Yeah, so the last item that I have on there is general maintenance slash new projects. That includes um, an allocation for um, the facilities of the department to, to have as kind of contingency for um, any projects that they have as well as then a portion that's just district-wide, not just facility-related any capital contingency. So that falls under that line there. So that's about $200,000 that um, doesn't have a, a specified use at this point. And just a quick question, you may not have this at hand if you want, that's fine. Um, we can circle back later. But for example, on the contract for the track, or for the 
features. We have we have um, the guaranteed maximums in those contracts. Of contractors. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, we do not have contracts for those, and and so we're working on getting those. These are budgeted yeah. now, based on yes. these are budgeted items. But remember, the, the bleachers are going to be probably closer to close to a million dollars. Sure. So this is just an allocation that we dedicated earlier on from the PI budget to start to uh, defray the or defray the cost. Um, and I know we have an owner's rep on, on yes, those which will, yes, and and we will we will approve the owner rep contract in September, and then in short order we will start to um, have the board approve some of the project costs. Um, most of the items we are using direct purchase, and so we can get consortium pricing, which lowers the um, overall cost um, to state term. So um, we're taking that route, one, to minimize the number of vendors that we have to deal with because we have the turf, the track, and the bleachers all trying to be done at the same time. Um, so uh, we are in conversations with the, those groups and working on pricing right now. But, to your point, having some type of cap is always you know, advantageous. Limit change orders. Right. To the extent you can negotiate. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And this is helpful for you. Yes. Great. And I appreciate the feedback. Thank you. Um, and then the final page, page seven, is just the cash revenue allocation for July. Um, any questions on the financial? July financial report before I jump into the report card. So the color, the blue, orange, green handout in your folder. Um, I'm just going to walk you, try to as simply as possible walk you through this. Uh, this is what we talked about last meeting. Um, this is how ODE puts together their per pupil expenditure amounts. Um, that is publicly available on the report card. So since this is a public measure, we wanted to take some time and kind of walk you through so you have a little bit of better understanding of what's included, what's not, and how the different categories work. So we will start at step one, so all the way to the left. So the first thing they do is exclude certain funds. So the funds of note for us the fund 022, the Newark Granville Community Authority money runs through that fund. So those, all of those expenditures are excluded. As well as we are self-insured for our flexible spending account. So that's fund 026 and that is excluded as well. And fund 200, which is student activities. So all of those expenses and those funds right off the bat are excluded. And moving on to step two, the 400 uh, or 470 objects are tuition. So included in that would be community school and open enrollment, as well as um, tuition paid to other districts, excess cost. So that's a big um, portion for us to look at because in the past we have coded um, community schools and Peterson and Autism Scholarships as, as well as college credit, college credit Plus expenses to an object code that was included when it should have been excluded. So from a reporting standpoint, um, that would impact our per pupil calculation. And just doing a rough estimate of what that would have been for last year is about $160 per pupil um, that was included that should have been excluded, if that makes sense. Um, a couple of the other objects that are excluded here are for principal payments for debt as well as advances and transfers. Um, if those are included, it would double up and uh, count expenditures twice. And then same with moving on to step three, the functions that are excluded are advances and transfers as well as contingency um, and refund of prior year receipts. So, those are all excluded right off the bat. Then moving into the colored section for step four, the classification by funds. 
Um, none of the funds that are listed there apply to us except for 401. It's in that green section towards the bottom. That's the auxiliary fund. So the money that we get from the state for Granville Christian runs through that account. So that is excluded from our per pupil as non-operating. Moving on to column four, step five, uh, classification by object. So object 645, um, towards the bottom in the green section, that is capitalized equipment. So all equipment falls under the non-operating and is excluded from the per pupil calculation. And then they just break it out into two different lines there as to whether it's instructional or non-instructional. Then it gets really fun in step six. Mm -hmm. Classification by function. So this is, um, as you can tell, really where a majority of the decision making comes, um, under which colored section everything falls. So I'm just gonna highlight just a few of what all of those different function codes mean. Um, so if you'll stick with me. <laughs> the first section there, the instruction, that is teacher salaries, paraprofessionals, um, even summer school, uh, academic related extracurricular advisors, stipends are all um, fall under instruction there. Then pupil support services, the next line, um, that's gonna be like guidance, nurse, psychologist, speech, social work, OTPT, all of those support positions fall under um, pupil support and are included in our instructional spend. And then the third line, um, instructional staff support services, that is where we code a majority of our professional development for teachers, as well as any curriculum development work that's done. So that's what makes up a bulk of that instructional spend, which is kind of the number that everybody throws around out there. Um, then moving into the orange section, general administration, the function codes there are for the Board of Education, Superintendent, um, Student Services, Director, Administrative um, Type Expenses. Uh, then moving into the next line versus School Administration, which is the principals, their secretaries, and their um, functions within their office. The next line is operation and maintenance of plans, so that's facilities and custodial services, as well as building grounds. Um, pupil transportation, that's self-explanatory, that's probably the only one on here that <laughs> is. Uh, and then the next line, other and non-specified support services, that is all of the treasurer's office function as well as um, our operations and administrative technology. So this is one item just to point out that we have to be really careful when we're buying technology and coding it to administrate, whether it's administrative technology and we're using a code that falls under this orange section or whether it's technology that students are going to be using and it's instructional and should fall in the blue section. So that's where um, the decision making really impacts what's reported on the, the state report card. Is most of that capitalized so it would be down in the green though? Most technology equipment that's got a longer life or? We do a lot of um, leases too and so that I think falls under the, the blue section. I'd have to double check because our, our capitalization threshold uh, is 5,000. So, For a piece of equipment? Yeah, and so, yeah, it doesn't always fall under that, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, okay, and then the final line in the orange section uh, is food service. So that our contract with ABI falls under non-classroom. Um, expenditure. Then the green section for non-operating, uh, the first line is shared services, which we don't have any expenditures that would fall under that category. Um, the next line is elementary, secondary, non-instructional, which is athletics. So that's where all of our coaches 
um, payments are, as well as the entire athletic fund. There are 300 funds included there. Huh. Which is not included in annual reports. expenditures. They're excluded? Not offering excluded. It, yeah, it's excluded from the per pupil, but it's included in, so it's included in non-operating. So it's not excluded from the report card in total, like the first three columns are, but that instructional um, per pupil amount that's actually on the report card, is, the athletics are not included in that. Um, the next line is community services, which I looked and we didn't have any expenditures in that line either, um, and same for adult education. As well as, um, well then the next line is the, with fund 401, that's the auxiliary fund, so that's their corresponding function. So Granville Christian's expenditures are not included in our uh, per pupil. Next is construction, so architecture services, site improvement, um, purchase of buildings, that's all included there under the construction line. And going along with that land and existing structures, so site acquisition is included, or is excluded, but under non-operating. And then we already talked about the uh, capitalized equipment. And then the final line is interest on debt. So interest is um, excluded. And categories that are non-operating. Um, and then the step seven is the final column and that is classification based on OPU. So that's our operational unit. So based on those different um, functions and whether it's an operational unit of a school building versus central office determines um, is like the tiebreaker for some of those functions as to whether it will fall under general administration or school administration in that orange section. So that is it in a nutshell, very clear cut as you can tell. Um, and so it is quite a bit open to interpretation in how schools and uh, folks that are actually doing purchasing code all of our expenditures. But this is um, kind of the format that's used across districts, but how you actually implement it is Another story. <laughs> so that is just the foundation that um, we can build off of as we continue talking about for people and that measure and, and what we want to do with it, um, just to give us a baseline. So you know, this dollars per pupil number is one that folks gravitate toward, and it's a pretty simplistic measure if you don't quite understand what's all in there. What's your sense about how different school districts can include or exclude things, and the amount of difference that could ultimately make? When districts are being compared. Is I that mean, kind of a 2% thing or is that a 15% thing or is it? I really, I, I can't probably speak and give a percentage like okay. that, but I can say that in previous districts I've seen where it has made a significant um, impact based on interpretation. So just for us to have $160 per pupil yeah. impact based on coding of a handful of items is pretty significant. Yeah. Um, I've also seen is, and it's really important with the high cost expenditures. Yeah. So one other example that I've seen in a previous district is um, sick leave payout. So um, past practice that I have seen most districts use is coding using the same function that that employee is paid out of. So teachers, their sick leave payout when they retire would be fall under um, instruction. Then I've seen in another district that actually includes that all under a function that would fall under non-classroom. And that's a pretty significant expenditure in some districts in some years. And so to have that fall under non-classroom for them, but classroom for us is a pretty big difference. Yeah. And so it's even hard to compare yourself, I think, across districts if you don't know how folks are coding certain big line items like that. Um, so it probably makes the most sense to just compare yourself to yourself over prior years, honestly, and just adjust for those known items that were um, actively changing and know we've changed the code on, and just kind of look at it over a uh, year over year comparison to ourselves. I think that's certainly my inclination, but our inclination to do 
that, right? But we're often, you know, compared by folks that don't write right. details like this, yeah. right? And it's, you know, kind of unfortunate that it's kind of a cloudy measure. We need to find ways to sort of communicate that and say, you know, if you're only looking at that one number, you're really not seeing the whole picture here of, you know, what the expenses are and what we get out of and so forth. So that's good to see this, although it's complicated, it's important to be able to appreciate that there can be some pretty significant differences when right. comparing amongst districts. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll definitely have to keep working and thinking about how to communicate that. Is this, I mean, that was, I don't know, a five minute conversation to walk you through it, but to translate that into a written document, um, I think it just gets cloudier and cloudier as you, yeah. you know, try to communicate to the masses, but I think this is a good first stab at getting us at least all on the same page. This is, this is a good step. It is is there something in Cup Patterson which is materially different? Um, that would not impact this. Um, this is on the expenditure side and that's only going to affect revenue. Um, I think it means it's a cup of work. Yes, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are new nuances. Yeah, it's significantly different. Yeah. Like, I think in that, all of the tuition, community school, all that stuff is included there. I'd have to double, they don't have a nice, pretty color <laughs> like this. No, it's black and white. <laughs> but we can do a similar uh, walkthrough, if that's helpful. In general, when you look at Cup Patterson versus ODE model, the cost per pupil is high. Yeah. Because right. they do include other things that ODE model yes. does not. Cut Patterson? Cut I mean, cut Patterson. 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 Cut Having said that, by the time the next letter rolls around, there will be demands appropriate for inquiries, appropriate inquiries about how we compare expenditure wise and accomplishment wise with some of the districts. So I think it will be incumbent upon us over the next couple of years to figure out what the right metrics are so that we know we're measuring apples to apples to the extent possible. Uh, I'm quite confident we, we hold up very well in those comparisons. But Based on the fact that she just talked about the capital expenditure, do we want to go right into Tanya's presentation? Is that going to screw everything up? Um, not for us. No. Might, might rattle Ryan a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do that just because it's hard to say. I couldn't hear what you said. It would be oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Adaptable would be better. <laughs> <laughs> So I think um, what we, we wanted to do was, obviously the summer is not over for the facilities department, but um, if you remember in the levy campaign, we talked a lot about our capital needs and the need to have a growing revenue stream to help offset some of the, the, um, the needs that are happening in our facilities. And you know, we have a 20-year plan. Within that plan, it says that we should be spending about $1.5 million annually. Um, we have been spending about a million, so we're trying to play a little bit of catch-up on the deferred maintenance side of the equation. And what I will tell you is, and I hope there, you're going to see through this journey of pictures, is a concerted effort to address some things that have been somewhat neglected over the last couple of years because of lack of revenue. So, um, we have here Anya Sherburn and Laurie Tubaugh, um, our new account manager from the so, fantastic. So, Tanya, take it from me. Yes, and Laurie. I would like to um, follow up with Jeff that Laurie was just recently named the account manager at the end of uh, June uh, this summer. And she has done a fabulous job of keeping uh, things moving throughout throughout the summer. The buildings look, I think, the best that they have in the five years that 
I've been here, and we've been able to complete um, a number of projects this summer. I think more projects than we have ever in the time that I've been here, which has only been five years. But still, she's doing some great things out there. So um, I asked her to be alongside me for this presentation. So um, this summer, our, one of the projects that we worked on was the uh, computer lab at the intermediate school. Um, we took out the tables um, and um, rearranged some of the electrical um, work, and we also replaced the carpet with the Formo design, which you've seen before. Um, and we did this because we wanted to make the space more of a project center um, to go along with what we're doing with PDL. And so this is what the computer lab now looks like. Uh, we were able to get many of the chairs and the uh, tables from State Farm. They had some things that they were giving away. That was in the May of last year. Yeah. So we were able to uh, capitalize on those. Uh, we are waiting for a few uh, bistro tables and chairs that we will also put at the intermediate uh, uh, lab there. So that is a completed project. Lori, can you talk about the bar? Bars. So the next slide is the middle school gym full of bars. The resting pull up bars at the middle school gym were taken down. We sanded them, painted them to give them a fresh new uh, to be in the school year. So that was one of the projects we were on this summer. And that was from our maintenance department. You can't really see the rust very well on that first picture, but they were pretty, pretty rusty on there. Uh, the basement, um, you have seen pictures of this previously. So um, again, I'll let Lori uh, speak about this. Thank you, Mr. Gies. Um, but we were able to. Um, address these issues of the uh, collapsing the ceiling um, and we basically um, blocked off the basement um, to protect that area. Do you want to talk a little bit more? Um, we just used a, um, we used on that a flowable fill material and then we had to take off the, um, um, they had to take off the manhole covers and we used that to go down through there to fill the basement and then um, we replaced those and then had those patched over and then seal coated over. So it's a pretty expensive project and it will be much safer mm -hmm. environment for that basement. Where did we, the basement in last we had a structural engineer look at it and make this recommendation yeah. for it's in the elementary school. It's in the back yeah. part where the old stage was, it's underneath there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it provides a little more to the structural integrity. Yes. Yeah. 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 Useful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is important. Um, so, Lori, um, these are just examples of what the rooms uh, look like. You know, for the past several years, we've been putting this four by four down uh, into the classroom. So, this year, we were able to do four rooms at GIS. One was the pro project area, uh, three rooms at the elementary school, and three rooms at the middle school. So can I, can I ask you generally, um, so my experience is in rehabilitating, renovating apartment buildings, and we always swap out the carpeting for things like mm -hmm. formal, or forward flooring and the like. We find it to be more durable, yes. last longer, easier to replace if you get a holes, and instead of having to take up the whole carpet, and more sanitary, easier to keep cleaner, finding similar experiences here. Correct. Each year, we move around the district and replace the areas of those tiny. Acoustically, is that an issue? Um, in the classrooms, um, sometimes there might be some um, rugs that they put down in certain areas, but I have not heard any complaints about it being an issue. I know in the offices, um, I know it's in the, we have the Formal and Lisa's office at GIS. We did put it in the conference room, we put up some uh, sound. Panels, thank you. <laughs> Sound panels to help, but it, it's not too bad. Okay, it was one of the classrooms. I was yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, the classrooms are, are generally okay. You want to talk about all the yeah. asphalt work? So, this is a photo of the intermediate school playground, and um, we also did a lot of um, seal coating in the parking lots. I don't know if you've been around the district, so we've done an extensive amount of the seal coating. And just so you know, the seal coating should be done every two years. Um, with that said, um, this helps avoid uh, extensive repairs um, to the parking lots and it helps maintain our lots. 
Um, and the last time seal coating was actually done was 2013. So it's been a while. Um, this will show you the intermediate, and then we have the ele elementary school alley in the parking area, and then we went down the alleyway too. Okay. Um, also, we've done rooftop replacements. So rooftop units 11, 14, and 15 were replaced with the elementary school, and we also replaced um, rooftop unit one at the um, middle school and that one for the gym. Um, the life expectancy with the proper maintenance of our rooftop units are actually 20 years. Um, some of the rooftop unit replacements were deferred and they should have been done in 2014. So we need to plan on replacing three to four uh, units a year over the next few years to get caught up. So that will show you the elementary school, the three units that were replaced. And that will show you a photo of one of the units um, on the right with the uh, middle school. Okay, so this was my favorite, favorite summer project just because it was my pet peeve. Um, the stairs uh, at the commons area were dug up and we put new stairs down. Um, we also, also fixed the sidewalk area. Um, it was too steep. Uh, they actually did not code so it was important that we got that done and if you've not been out there yet I know you'll see it on Thursday but I um, might want to take a close look it looks really nice um, we actually have grass growing in now so that's my favorite project of the summer <laughs> Um, this is the high school. I mean, I'm not sure if many of you have come up to the front of the entrance of the high school by the west main, but the piping has been exposed for some years. Um, so we have um, done some work to the exposed gutter. Um, the piping was dug up. We replaced it with a new asphalt base, and it was laid. And if Tanya looks over, it'll show you the pictures of the process as we were going along getting the pipe laid. And then that is the final product. So no pipe exposed, safe for the kids to come to school. We did lots of roofing um, this summer. Um, so we'll just take you through these slides to show you the before and after shots of um, the roofing projects. You can add information that you'd like to. Um, we replaced it with a Duralast material that will last for some time um, down the future. We shouldn't have to do any type of, hopefully, any type of maintenance, extra repairs for leaks on our roofs. Um, the first section one, and that was the administrative area at the middle school. Um, section 1A was the teacher lounge and the technology office area of um, Eric Thompson. Um, section two was the middle school custodial office area. There's a hatch that comes up and the water would actually go down the stairs from the roof leaks. So that has been repaired. Section three was um, over the senior lounge stairs in the commons area. So that was repaired. And the picture on the right is the new Duralas roof. Um, section four was the art studio. Um, as you can see, that's a pretty rusty RTU that's going to probably have to be repaired down the line. Um, the picture is right, it's a finished product. If you go to um, section five, that's the west wing hallway of the high school, and that was repaired. And the photo to the right is the new roof. In section six, it's going to be our athletic area, um, right over the fitness um, weight room area, and the picture to the right is the new roof. Um, and lastly, we did the soccer um, press box roof. Um, the soccer um, press box actually got a makeover um, through the school year, and the roof wasn't replaced at the time. Um, the roof didn't meet my safety code. It's now been re um, replaced, and people were safe to get up there to video, um, video take the games and photograph the games. So. <coughs> Another project we had was uh, the girls' senior lounge women's restroom. Um, so the ceiling was removed to the damage insulation on the chilled and heating piping staining the ceiling. Um, the new vapor insulation was put in place and the ceiling was put back in and they are working on getting that painted this week prior to school starting. This is Tanya's favorite. This is second favorite. <laughs> Dry 
Friday. Um, we purchased a new truck because the old truck was rusting out, as you can see on the photos to the left, and it was unsafe for a person to drive. Um, so the photos on the right are the new um, picture of the um, new maintenance truck. And then we need to look at replacing our um, green pickup truck for next year because it's pretty much in the same condition. Sure. The observation deck. Um, have you seen the observation deck yet that was completed out at the intermediate school? It is just lovely. The view is really nice. Um, but we needed to have a sidewalk to the observation deck to the ADA requirements. So um, this is that area in forms. And when did they pour the concrete? Is it done now? The, con the concrete was poured today. So the farms will be taken okay. out this week. And so, and then put the railing up on the ramp because there's a ramp that goes up to the observation deck. If you remember, the observation deck was a, a EDL project um, for students to um, who potentially have ADA issues still enjoy the, the views. Um, you can see some of the kiosks that are attached to the rail that describe what students might see. Um, that was also an additional EDL project. Um, what was interesting was, at first, we didn't plan on doing this concrete work, but um, final permitting required us to, to do that. So we went back to the, to the students and made sure that they were aware to include um, those types of things in their next round of improvements. But the deck itself is a fantastic addition oh. from an educational perspective, and also has great community involvement. All right. Right. Yes, it's largely so, funded by contributions. Yeah, largely funded by almost all, uh, except for the concrete work. So, um, Terra Nova, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, materials were, some of them were donated by Home Depot. So, yeah. Uh, that's that's that was great a collaboration. And great the students being able to leave the PBL aspects of it, that's, yes. that's, yeah, right there. that's great. Yeah. Jeff, did you talk to the board about the um, groundbreaking ceremony? No, uh, not yet. Did I put? I think I put something. I did. I put something in the board information flyer. But um, I believe that Scott Bryan is um, having several dignitaries, uh, potentially Governor DeWine. Uh, I believe it's the twenty seven. I think it's the twenty seven. Twenty seven. Uh, I'll have to look at my calendar. But yes, there is a groundbreaking twenty seventh of Monday afternoon. Yep.
that was a perfect example of delayed maintenance, and where you know you end up spending more in the long run because you're not being you're not able to do the preventative maintenance to extend the lifetime of the asphalt. So I, I think getting back on those schedules actually saves taxpayer dollars, you know, down the road. Uh, but we are playing a little bit of catch up. But uh, as you can see, a lot of work got accomplished in a very short period of time. Um, kudos to the entire uh, maintenance department. Do you have your job? So, so playing catch up, like a, so the couple of rooftop units are included in that, because you said that they're going to have to redo those, probably a bunch of them for the next couple of years. Anything else like that were uh, big ticket items that, I mean, the big, obviously, is pretty good. Um, the other thing I can see is some of the anger handlers, too, mm -hmm. because Well, I'm going to just urge you to continue doing what you're doing. This is consistent with what we said we would do in the levy campaign. Prepare the items that need to be repaired. Focus on life safety issues. And every day items that you said we're going to neglect them, we end up replacing them instead of them. Yeah, absolutely. Good start. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to many of those presentations in the future where we can you know, modernize our facilities and keep them safe use. So, um, next is the Portrait of a Blue Ace, which is our final rendition of the Portrait of a Graduate. Um, let me remind you that this is the culmination of a very long, extensive process of community and stakeholder input, including uh, students and staff. And um, we've had a design team of teachers, administrators, working with um, the Patel for team, Kids team uh, to come up with this visual and then the articulation of some of the competencies. But what I, what I want to go back to is the learning foundations. The learning foundations are the, the intersection of curriculum assessment and instruction to get at the heart of student learning. And, and in, that is done in the context of 21st century skills. What we did was we articulated which competencies and mindsets and dispositions we feel are most critical for success in the future. Um, it's not, you, you can always find, you know, an exhaustive list, um, but this is something that we will do, um, we will embed and intentionally integrate into every aspect of our learning organization, K through 12. So you see the Blue Aces uh, are, um, collaborative, adaptable, responsible, critical thinkers, empathetic, and resilient. And so we have some icons that are associated with uh, each one of those. And those icons are important because they are visual images of some of what the competencies describe. Um, you can see there are some iconic photos um, of some aspects of Granville included. But I think those blue, dark blue icons um, really represent the intersection of deep, rich academic content with those mindset uh, or competencies, uh, 21st century skill sets. So you have, you know, technology, science, literacy, drama, music, art, um, science, social studies, athletics, uh, all those kind of represented in that notion of a portrait of a blue ace. And if you remember when we went through the um, process of identifying the mission statement, the G down below actually had three sections. Um, one was about the students, the second section was about the parents, and then, the, uh, well, parents, teachers, and then the arrow, or kind of arrow moving forward, was about the students and how they, their journey towards becoming a Blue Ace. So I think this, imagery captures uh, that journey and it's something that we can brand now and use across all facets of our organization. What I loved most is when I went to the athletic um, fall meeting, this was referenced um, to parents as part of the athletic program. I would like that to be referenced in every meeting that we have with students and parents so that we under that it becomes deeply a part of our culture. Um, so 
Brian, if you scroll down, um, you'll see the uh, second image has a, a portrait of a blue ace up above it, and then you have some of the uh, descriptions down below. What I'd like to do is have Ryan talk a little bit about what we plan on doing in the unpacking process with the staff that is going to occur. And for the staff members here, we expect you to be embargoed until Thursday. <laughs> when I release this to the rest of the staff, no pictures, nothing. Okay. So we do plan on unveiling this to the staff on Thursday, but um, this is one of the seminal uh, board level artifacts that I think will drive our, our improvement in the future. So. Ryan, do you want to talk a little bit about what we did with team leaders and then what the PD will look like for staff? Sure. So the whole purpose of the unpacking process is so that we have a shared understanding. Um, without a shared understanding of what collaborative means, we would literally get 175 different definitions of what collaboration means within our schools amongst each staff member. Um, so we're going to unpack that starting at grade levels. Uh, each grade level will go through a process where They'll look at the definitions that we're all going to start with. So we're starting with common definitions, but what does collaborative mean at the kindergarten level? And we talk about assume shared responsibility and value of individual contributions to achieve a common goal. That looks very different at kindergarten than it does at the 12th grade level, but there's some things that interwoven interwo in between all of those grade levels that will be consistent. Um, so they're going to start with those definitions and what does that look like? What does it mean? What do we as teachers do at the kindergarten level, and what do our students be doing at the kindergarten level uh, for each one of these and every grade level after that? Um, so that's the very first part of this, so that you get that shared understanding of these are the definitions we're starting with, but what does it look like in my grade level? Um, then later on in the year, at one of our um, one of our professional development days that we'll have later on in the year in November, uh, we'll get together in grade level bands. Um, and those grade level bands are still to be determined, but we're thinking about grade level bands like K through two, three through five, six through eight, and then nine, 10, and 11, and 12. And you notice that some of those overlap our buildings. That's very intentional. Um, so that it carries over, you start the process for this next level, this next evolution of these um, skills in these different grade levels, and it carries over into the next building. So there's that cross communication uh, between the intermediate school and the elementary school. Um, but we're all starting from the same definitions. It's just going to mean something a little different at each grade level. And then collectively um, putting those grade level thoughts together in those bands. And that becomes what's really our instructional framework for these. Those, all those things are only as good as the pieces of paper that they're on. Uh, the staff would bring those to life. And that's what we're going to give them time to do. Um, not just this year, but in the next year and the year after is to how can they embed these things in the, into the PBL projects that they're all already doing. The other things that the great things that they're doing in the classroom, but intentionally teach students some of these skills and also bring them to life in the classroom. Modeling it, noticing it, um, making sure that uh, students have exposure to that, and, and catching students doing the great things that they do that are related to these competencies. And I think that's how you get uh, that momentum going forward um, in the classroom. So Ryan said, bring it to life. That's the theme. So bring the portrait to life. Obviously, our mission is learning for life. Bringing the portrait to life, he, he touched on what we've been messaging. It's, it's about modeling it. It's about noticing it in others. And then it's also capitalizing on teachable moments. You know, as parents or people who have been around kids, that they always provide you with moments to give them little tidbits about life. Um, so when we have an anchor document or a North Star like a portrait of a blue ace, uh, it gives us the ability to really be intentional about those, those noticing teachable moments. So we're very excited about our teachers getting a hold of this and really bringing the portrait to life. There's such a strong connection with the opportunities in project-based learning to really flesh out a lot of these things, and I hope that that's seen as a great contribution to the way that we teach PBL and the way we that, right? Because I just see so many of these elements will come out strongly with collective projects, and with real world kind of things, and the troubles that you end up with, we have to be resilient and adaptable, and so forth. So I hope that the PBL theme is just really reinforced with this. But well, we don't and forget and that. What's and crazy is every time I hear students talk about their PBL projects, mm -hmm. like uh, Chloe Malford last year talking about the BA theory. 
And, you know, they use this language. They talk about having to be adaptable uh, because certain things didn't go the way that they had intended. Well, that's life. You know, that's, that's learning for life. And so, Thomas, you're absolutely right. Those project-based learning opportunities fit very well in exposing the portrait of a graduate of competency. But it's also in the daily lessons, you know, that that that, that rich academic content can also com be complemented by the portrait of a graduate of competency. Yeah. Any questions about our portrait of Blue Ace? And Brian, thank you for being adaptable and uh, switching around the presentation. <laughs> we are now at the point in our agenda where we welcome public comments. If anyone is so inclined, step forward to the podium, share your comments or thoughts with us. <laughs> Next is board discussion. Any comments that you would like to make on any of the staff reports? I'm just going to bring up one quick thing. I had the opportunity to attend the school board um, president's caucus at the COTC. Uh, and this is an annual event where the school boards in the area are invited to come and approve their board of trustees. And it was really great to go there and be with uh, members of other school boards in our surrounding communities. Uh, COTC is a great resource, and I think we can take even further advantage of it. They have a new president this year, uh, John Barry, uh, who was a Granville parent uh, of Intel. His son graduated about five years ago, and he moved down to the Carolinas for working at universities down there. But now he's back as uh, president of COTC. He's got a real mind for collaboration with local school districts as well, finding a way to do college credit plus in a places where it's appropriate and finding ways to collaborate because they have you know, some fantastic resources, you know, much like we you know, are taking more and more advantage of CTEC, right? I think at COTC there's also similar opportunities for kids to get some great real world experience, you know, as a side class for in high school or as a career pathway following school. So, I was excited to see some new energy there. Uh, we reappointed Gordy Yance to the Board of Trustees, and there's a new appointment of Park Shea, uh, who will be on the COTC board as well. So I felt great energy there, and it's just neat to be able to represent our district and uh, be with some other surrounding districts as well. So just bring that up. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming over again. Yeah. I just had a quick question that I meant to ask during the um, report. Um, could you just Describe a little bit about the timing of when income tax comes in versus the property tax. Yeah, uh, just so specifically. Yeah, so the um, income tax comes in four times a year, um, quarterly, and it's phased in. So our first payment in April was not the full amount that we'll receive going forward. So that will build up to the full amount and um, receive that payment in April. So then from then forward, it should be pretty constant. Um, amount from quarter to quarter. Um, then real estate comes in in two batches per year, I guess. Um, so we receive the settlement usually in August and then in February, March time period are the two settlements. And in between there, we receive advances from the county auditor will send us um, a portion of what they've collected up into to certain points. Um, so like for this settlement that we're receiving at the end of this, or anticipating receiving by the end of August, um, like we received our third advance payment this past week. So they send a couple different um, advances before you receive the final settlement. But it is more um, heavily weighted at two different points in the year, unlike the income tax, which is um, pretty consistent throughout the year. And you mentioned that the payment that we received for income tax is significantly ahead of what we had forecast. Is that timing, or do you think there's something else happening there that we need to understand? 
percent of our shape. Yeah, um, we're going to need to dig into that a little bit to better um, for me to better understand what we forecasted and whether it is timing or not, um, or whether it's you know there were some like refunds included on the the um, settlement that we received from the Department of Taxation. So I don't know if um, like more employers are withholding and sending it yeah. instead of employee or instead of residents paying it themselves on their estimated. So it's there's a lot of different factors that I think it could be. So especially after the next payment and we get a better better idea of is this long term or is it you know a timely kind of thing uh, will be easier to. Forecast. It's just hard with nothing to really go on. Yeah. The only thing that I would add to the board discussion is just a comment about the event on Friday night. Um, it was a fantastic evening. Uh, the weather was beautiful. The hot dogs were stellar. <laughs> uh, Mr. Burnett has tinfoil cuts all over his hands. <laughs> he wrapped about a thousand hot dogs. Um, Good one, eat one. Yes. <laughs> um, but it was it was a, an amazing feel good evening. And and I just want to you know publicly thank the private committee that is um, going through that process of collecting pledges and donations for our public private partnership of the new athletic facility. Um, there was a lot of energy a lot of positive energy about the future of that facility. So um, kudos to that team. I'd like to say, I mean, the fact that we had our arts boosters up there with our athletic boosters, with our athletic director and the community support just felt right. You know, it was just really good to see that level of collaboration that brought everybody together in the community down to the GRD kids that got to come out as well and, and, uh, and celebrate with us. So yeah, that was really cool. So next is the action agenda. Um, item 9.01 is the appointment of the delegate to attend the annual business meeting of the Ohio School Boards Association. I believe that um, the short straw is typically <laughs> the person identified for that job. So who, who would like to volunteer? Not it. Not it. <laughs> <laughs> I did it last year. Yeah. <laughs> I did it year before that. <laughs> I'll do it again if then no, the same time. I'll tell you what, Fred, we'll negotiate. Maybe maybe I'll do it last time. Whatever. It's fine. Thank you for stepping up. <laughs> Excellent. We need a motion on that? Uh, <laughs> we we will a motion to yes. I'd like to make a motion to the point that the district delegate to the increase is being in high school boards association for your parents were a sucker. Sweet. Any discussion? <laughs> Vote quick. Yeah. That's during the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Miller. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Foreman. Aye. Mr. Wolf. No. <laughs> Mr. Schneider. Totally appropriate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much for taking that honorable position. Uh, 9.02 is the agreement with the learning spectrum. So moved. Second. Okay, that is just our annual agreement for services for students with special needs. And that's not a flat fee, that's a fee for based on use. Yes, yes. correct. It is um, considered a seat license, so to speak. And is that in district? No. Okay. That is, they, they are? They are, it's a they separate are. facility. Okay. Where is that? It's actually towards Columbus. Okay. They are supposed to be building. Gwen, are they building a TLS site out in Newark? No, they actually were in Newark for one year, and oh. then they purchased um, land and property in Johnstown, or now right off of 62. Okay. Um, and that's their, their new permanent home. Okay. Um, so they combined Sunbury and Newark into one location. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Mr. Miller? Aye. Ms. Deep? Aye. Mr. Wolf? Aye. Dr. Foreman? Aye. 
Mr. Janice. Aye. Thank you. Uh, 9.03 is the approval of bus routes for the 1920 school year. Second. Second. And uh, there have not been any changes since the reduction of the one bus route last year. What's our longest? Uh, we try and stay right around 45 minutes as our longest, but there are some routes that, um, especially with students with special needs, because of having multiple students on the bus at the same time, that potentially are wheelchairs that take longer to um, move off, that it can be 45 minutes to an hour at times. But we really try and stay close to 30 minutes to 40, 45. But if you notice, it is um, it is scheduled for an every other year uh, course offering. Uh, but it is our first kind of introduction into a true field research uh, experience for our students. So um, Diane McDonald and Mara Hoover are here. Do you want to say anything, guys? If you have questions, we're happy to okay. answer them. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's a trip to Andros Island. It's a field station there where students will be actively engaged in research. And so uh, that's a one period class at the high school during the school year. Or uh, did we get one? Did we? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, the, so we are modeling after New Albany's um, already very well established program. And they have always taken it as a, um, it is a one credit science class. However, they do it outside of the school day. Um, it is through sort of a, um, you sign up for it because you are paying for the class and the field trip that's also on the session set yeah. all at once. And it, right now, the way they have it designed is that it, you do it outside of the school day. And so we'll set a time and, um, sort of larger blocks of instructional time, maybe two hours at once. Um, however, when I saw this on the agenda the way it was, I thought maybe this would possibly give us some leeway in the future after we get it established to make it a semester course with the, um, with the, field, with experience the field experience at the end. The end. Um, but again, we are making use of the wisdom and experience of New Albany um, instructors and their district. And so we're kind of just saying, yes, we'll model it just like you're doing and learn how to do that from there. And we're going to go on the experience with them. So New Albany, we are going to go with them as a school together. For the first year. Mm -hmm. And their superintendent is very supportive. <laughs> <laughs> That's his dad. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, from a scheduling perspective, it probably is a lot easier to facilitate if there's a way to get together outside of a class schedule so you don't need that one period where your other class is offered or something like that. That's great. So this is being offered this year for the first time. Correct. And is, was this offered at the time of enrollment or is this going to be announced kind of at the beginning of the year to recruit as many as we can? Well, we were really hoping for this board approval so that we can go make our flyers to <laughs> start advertising. Um, yeah, so we kind of just... The we final piece right here tonight night, yeah. so that we could actually... Good. And the field trip will require the board chaperone, correct? Right? <laughs> board <laughs> I've seen the accommodations. We might have made Mrs. Janelle class to the STEM lab. That was a great experience. And so yeah. I, you know, ever since that in sixth grade when we did that, mm -hmm. that was I was hoping something like this would come along yeah. because it was a great experience. We were only there for overnight, but it was um, I'm glad, I'm glad and dorm through. living there, right? Because yeah, that's what we had. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it is. It is very similar to that. Right. We've both been on Stone Lab experiences. So. And that, it goes just for a different model, right? You know, it's just a different way to deliver content, right? And especially with the, you know, the field experience that's associated with it, that's kind of unparalleled. That's great. But I think that you know, the more we can be creative about this and whether it be, you know, 
a block of time outside of a normal period or some other way to offer this credit and this experience, I think is great. Yeah. yeah we're excited. I'm slightly nervous. <laughs> but I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're going to get a great deal of response on this. We're hopeful. Yeah. Other questions? Mr. Miller? Aye. Dr. Corman? Aye. Ms. Dietz? Aye. Mr. Wolf? Aye. Mr. Denise? Aye. Go make your flyers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go make your flyers. Well done. That's right. Uh, the next item is 9.05, the approval of the box, a box truck purchase. Okay, so um, if you remember during our PI conversations earlier, uh, the band truck that we use to transport all the um, instruments is was on its last leg, and um, you know, I feel like we have an obligation to provide a truck that can facilitate their movement, um, and so. We worked with a local vendor, Coughlin, and they are going to um, provide the art boosters with that van for $50,000. So we're going to be purchasing that van. And it's about a $75,000 van, so they're heavily discounting that, um, that van for us, which is great. Um, we will make sure that it's identified as a Coughlin donation. Uh, but they do a lot of great work for us. They do the You Make a Difference Award, and, and so they're they're very helpful in securing things like this for our students. So this truck is used every time they go to a, an event to win, whether it's a away football game or marching band competition or anything else? Yes. And didn't we also use it last year when the football team traveled extensively with the yeah, equipment? So we've, we've tried to co-use <laughs> when possible. I think what we're, what we're going to try and do is um, the music boosters try to temporarily fix the um, existing bus. We will probably, or box truck, probably convert that to help um, the football team transport their equipment as well. So um, we're still going to try and keep it in, in operation. But a lot of that equipment can also be put on buses. But the orchestra used it too, and they went to the it will have a lot of use. And you used it when they went to Florida. Yeah. yeah. How many breakdowns did they have last year? I recall. I know. But I, <laughs> I, I can just tell you that when the um, band went to the Telfer Conference kid uh, um, conference and performed their uh, Looney Tunes, it um, the truck broke down there too. So <laughs> uh, regularly. Yeah. I heard a couple of stories from parents who drove that. Stuck on the side of the road and having to offload in the middle of the night. Yeah, it's, it's, it, <laughs> this is in the best interest of safety. <laughs> it's phrased that we're buying it for the Randall Arts Boosters. It's so a district. It's a district owned vehicle. vehicle. So, yeah, okay. And the Arts the arts Boosters paying to have it painted? Yes. It's going to be wrapped and painted and all dolled up. Thanks, Chicago. Yeah, lots of good stuff for maybe this. Twenty-two. 
Yes, including Brittany. And including, yeah. yeah. She so keeps trying to get out of new, uh, new, new employee orientations. And I, you know, oh, I keep harassing her. I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you talk about the singing yet? Okay. Okay. She's like, remember, I don't want to do that. I work for the Board of Education. <laughs>
I didn't understand. Okay? Don't let it die for lack of a second. Second. <laughs> 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 I think that's third. <laughs> Uh, okay, Ms. Deeds? Aye. Dr. Foreman? Aye. Mr. Wolf? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Deeds? Aye. Thank you. Thank you all.